Welcome to another edition of the Damian Vlog. My name is Dr. David Dizer. I'm the medical director here at DamianHealth.com and a naturopathic doctor in uh, private practice in Vancouver, British Columbia. On this show, we talk about all things holistic health and wellness related. If you're interested in that topic and these types of shows in general, please subscribe. We'll be doing more videos like this one. Today, we're talking about cortisol at night and um, how cortisol can affect sleep in general. So in my clinical practice, I use the holistic approach to treatment as a foundational principle in naturopathic medicine um, when moving forward regardless of the reason someone comes in we're looking at all organ systems of the body we're looking at all lifestyle aspects of uh, daily living one of the key ones we always look at is sleep quality of sleep length of sleep um, if someone's recovering or not if it's if it's satisfactory for them in general or if it isn't so um, in a sleep assessment Occasionally, we're having to do cortisol assessments. Now, the reason I normally go down this path would be as if it would be is if there is extreme anxiety, or uh, maintenance insomnia, or onset insomnia. So, inability to stay asleep or inability to fall asleep, and then associated anxiety. So, the key question I, I, I use here is whether or not someone has ruminating thinking at night. So I usually ask, you know, do you have ruminating thoughts that you can't get away from? And if so, how long does it take you to get past those thoughts? What tools do you use? What makes you feel good? These type of questions are really, really helpful. So if you're dealing with onset or maintenance insomnia, or if you have significant stress at night, um, this video might be, of, uh, might be of value to you. Cortisol assessments are essential in insomnia. I really believe that. Um, uh, I, I see another type of presentation that is associated with cortisol, uh, uh, associated with the cortisol issue, which is early waking. Early waking can be a early cortisol awakening response, and we'll speak a little bit about that later. So, how do we assess cortisol? So, you've got insomnia, you've got anxiety, you feel like you have maybe a little bit of ruminating thinking before bed. Well, the the pathway that I tend to take people down is through 24-hour urine cortisol assessment, 24-hour urine cortisone assessment. So if we track how much cortisol is present in the urine, how much cortisol is converted to cortisone in the kidneys, and count 24-hour cortisone in the urine, we can see the metabolites of each, we can get a total cortisol output of the adrenals for the day, and then we can get exactly how much cortisol was released at each time the sample was taken. So we know it should track in a nice rhythm where you've got lots of cortisol output in the morning. When your melaton melatonin goes down, cortisol comes up, it's time to start the day, let's get going. With each meal, there's a little bump. Um, 30, 30 minutes to 60 minutes after waking, there's a cortisol awakening response where you should feel your best. And then as the day goes on, cortisol kind of gets lower and lower until about 10.30 p.m. when melatonin should jump up and we should be good to go for sleep. Now, seeing the dinner time and the before bed cortisol measurements are really, really helpful for me. Whenever I do this, I also see a 24 hour uh, adrenaline metabolite assessment. So we get to see if the adrenals are overproducing adrenaline and noradrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, throughout the, that period of 24 hours as well. It kind of tracks with cortisol. So if cortisol is high, adrenaline very often is high as well, or adrenaline metabolite anyhow. So this is a great test that, that, that can go along with it. So, you know, the typical presentation, whether it be onset insomnia, maintenance insomnia, or um, stress in general would be a high cortisol level at night. This happens. What is the cause? Why is this happening? So, so uh, in terms of causation, we've got a few things that could happen. We've got some uh, external stimulus at night, whether it be exercise or too much food before bed, uh, too much technology or blue light before bed, maybe stressful conversations, uh, maybe some trauma at night during the day of the test that could jump it up as well, boost it up as well. Um, uh, it could be the time when you deal with your trauma. It could be the time when you you, you process the stress of the day. Um, but the, probably the most common one would be circadian rhythm uh, um, circadian rhythm disruption. So basically, having most of your energy at night and no energy in the morning, and that corresponding exactly perfect with the cortisol release uh, measurements. So anyhow, what do we do? Okay, so we've got high cortisol at night. Um, clinically here, we go through the lifestyle things. We try to suppress it through avoiding technology. We try to not have stressful events occur at night. We try to avoid television, blue light in general. We try to do physical things that can be very relaxing, like Epsom salt baths. 
um, and and gentle light reading, for example. We uh, then move to the dietary avoidance. We try to avoid food in general. We avoid all stimulants, no caffeine. Um, we con consider some very gentle, relaxing teas like passionflower chamomile tea. Um, some people go valerian hops if they want, if they have had success with that. And then we move to, towards nutrient therapy. So we try to bring down cortisol at night by prescribing things that that modulate the GABAergic system. So we try to bring GABA levels up naturally. Sometimes we use L-theanine, L-glycine for that. Um, sometimes we will go the route of 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 combo therapy. We're overriding a, a, maybe a low melatonin signal by giving a little bit of melatonin to begin to regulate the circadian rhythm like let's get this this day stopped so that we can wake up and get started tomorrow then do some blue light therapy in the morning we do a bit of th circadian rhythm assessment and and modulation in that in that sense um, we do very often and it's probably the most common thing i do in this case would be ashwagandha therapy magnolia therapy phosphatidylserine therapy before bed I use a product called cortisol manager i use gonda 600 I use these different products to try to bring cortisol down artificially, then tie up the lifestyle things before bed, and then aggressively work on circadian rhythm um, through counseling therapy, like, hey, here's what's gonna happen. Tomorrow morning, you need to do 30 minutes where you're getting your blood flow going, you're getting a little bit of a cold shower, you're getting some blue light therapy. You're gonna do that for 30 minutes every single day um, for the next three months. Like 12 weeks in a row, we got this morning routine where we get ourselves going and we try to go to bed at the same time every single night. The most difficult cases I've seen with this is um, people who have a 40-year a, a history of shift work, so whether it be nurses or construction workers or people who have had to work at night for this period of time. It's very difficult to, to flip this switch. We've had some success, however, with a, a complex protocol, some supplementation, some, some nutritive therapy, so food avoidance three hours before bed, lifestyle change, um, and tea therapy and then circadian rhythm tips so let's get the cortisol going in the morning let's get it suppressed at night we have got to flip the switch on the body how can this affect you long term so let's say you have this presentation you did 24-hour urine you saw some some measurements suggesting your rhythm was flipped upside down what happens eventually this can turn into burnout when you when it, when you have insomnia for long enough, or at least poor quality of sleep for long enough, it really, really takes its toll on the body. Your, your metabolism goes down, you gain some weight, um, stress goes up, your coping mechanisms are reduced. Testosterone is, is significantly suppressed when you don't have quality of sleep. Growth hormone is suppressed when you, have, when you have, don't, qual, don't have quality of sleep. So recovery is just literally the worst when you don't sleep. It's the worst. You can have delayed onset muscle soreness. You can have um, generalized aches and pains and chronic inflammation, a whole bunch of things. The most common thing that comes in is probably mood change and fatigue. Um, it's so incredibly common. And this assessment, this way of thinking for this functional issues, not dangerous. It is dangerous long term, but acutely it's not that dangerous. But long term high cortisol at night is such a nightmare. So functionally, we want to get ahead of this by doing this kind of assessment. We want to work through the different categories of treatment, whether it be lifestyle, wake up at the same time every morning, don't exercise at, at night, that type of thing, or whether it be nutritive, ashwagandha, magnolia, phosphatidylserine, a B6 can suppress cortisol like crazy, avoid the things that are stimulating, avoid B5, avoid caffeine, um, avoid the ginseng, uh, the Penix ginseng, avoid the stimulating things, avoid stressful conversations, um, and then implementing some very gentle therapy like Epsom baths, like magnesium therapy. Um, and, and teas like chamomile, valerian hops, passion flower. I really like passion flower when we have sort of mid-afternoon cortisol spikes that kind of last the rest of the day because fat, passion flower tends to be non-drowsy. So you can take it at lunch, you can take it at dinner. These type of things are things that we would consider in the practice if you were coming in with severe insomnia, ruminating thinking, anxiety in general, uh, with no success with the conventional therapies. Yes, Zopiclone will shut it down, Zopiclone will make you sleep, but it won't treat the cause and you still could have this hormonal fluctuation that could be causing you burnout in the long term. Um, overriding this with a strong sleep med uh, can be helpful in the short term because you need to sleep. I'm not against the drugs. If you need to sleep, we need to do something dramatic to get you sleeping. But in the long term, circadian rhythm management is essential in high cortisol at night. Hope this clears up some things for people. This is kind of modern stuff. You know, we, 
we um, think this uh, urine metabolite cortisol measurements are extremely helpful in managing these types of conditions, stress and insomnia. So I really love them and I want to tell everyone about it. So thank you for watching. If you like holistic health and wellness videos, please subscribe. We'll do more like this. Okay, have a great day.